Hello, Graysteel Nation, and Happy New Year. We're back with another research review, our first of the new year, joined once again by our newest faculty, Vicki Volkov, who is a strength and conditioning coach, massage therapist, anatomist, and all-around exercise science nerd, uh, joining us from Tel Aviv, Israel. Happy New Year, Vicki. Happy New Year. Uh, Vicki's already become a very important part of what we do here on the research review, and I'm really looking forward to having her on a lot in the new year. She does a lot of hard work on background and she knows how to find and read uh, the literature that's relevant for us. Okay, so today we're going to be talking about the paper by Bischoff Ferrari et al, the DO Health, or I guess Do Health randomized clinical trial. Uh, Vicki will give us the full title in a moment. This is a multi-center trial from Europe that's been getting uh, a good deal of attention. Uh, so it's an important paper, but not necessarily a good one. And we're going to try to help you all get your head around it. Uh, Vicki, why don't you give us the title and a quick abstract of the design methods and um, the results. Okay, so we're talking about the effect of vitamin D supplementation, omega-3 fatty acid supplementation, or a strength training exercise program on clinical outcomes in older adults. This is the Do Health randomized clinical trial published on November uh, 2020 on JAMA. And study objectives as presented in its protocol were uh, to improve healthy aging in European seniors and to reduce healthcare costs via implementation of an effective and broadly applicable disease prevention interventions. They also mentioned two specific objectives, which were to establish whether vitamin D, omega-3 fatty acids and or and or a simple home exercise program will prevent disease at older age and to assess comparative effectiveness and cost benefits of the interventions. So uh, this randomized double blind placebo controlled trial had three primary treatment comparisons. The first one was uh, 2000 IU per day vitamin D compared with placebo. Second was one gram a day per, of omega threes compared with placebo. And the third was tra strength training exercise program of 30 minutes or three times per week compared with an attention control exercise program focused on joint flexibility. Also 30 minutes, uh, three times a week. The trial was performed at seven centers in Switzerland, France, Germany, Portugal, and Austria. Uh, study participants were 2,157 uh, older adults aged uh, 70 plus uh, and community dwelling. The inclusion criteria were no major health events like uh, cancer or my myocardial infraction in the five years prior to enrollment and sufficient mobility to come to the study centers without help. Um, recruitment was also conducted with the goal of including at least 40% of participants with history of falling in the prior 12 months to increase presentation of older adults at higher risk of frailty. Uh, as to randomization and masking, there were, uh, the participants were randomized into one of eight treatment groups stratified by recruitment center, prior fall, sex and age. Uh, range of ages was 70 to um, 85 and even older. And participants received two gel capsules per day, uh, vitamin D or placebo and omega-3s or placebo, of course, identical in size, appearance, taste and weight. And the exercise intervention program, which was called strength exercise program was not uh, actually uh, described in the, in the study, but in the protocol. Yes, um, yes, <laughs> yes, yes. We, we looked for it uh, a bit. Uh, and yeah. Uh, it, and it was consisted of uh, five um, simple exercises, sit to stand, one leg stance, uh, pullbacks against elastic resistant band, seated, external shoulder rotation against elastic resistant band, also seated, and steps. While the control exercise program, which was called flexibility exercise program, was consisted of hip and knee mobility seated, hip mobility standing, trunk and chest mobility seated, shoulder mobility seated, and ankle mobility standing. So this was the exercise intervention and control. Outcomes. Uh, six primary outcomes were measured for five health main, domain, main domains. Uh, the systolic and diastolic blood pressure change for cardiovascular health, non-vertebral fracture 
lectures for bone health and short physical performance battery uh, or SPPB for muscle health. Uh, Montreal cognitive assessment uh, for brain health and infections for immune system health. All four co continuous outcomes uh, were assessed at baseline and at 12, 24 and 36 months. Um, I'll describe briefly the SPPB because uh, it's related to the muscle health uh, outcome. Uh, it's actually a performance-based test that includes three components, walking velocity, time for five repeated chair stands or sit to stands, and a balance test. Uh, a zero to four score is assigned to each one of the three tests, where four is the best score, and scores are summed to yield an overall score ranging from uh, zero to 12, where again, 12 is the best score. So this is the SPPB. Mm -hmm. um, physical activity and metabolic equivalent tasks were assessed with the nurse's health study questionnaire. And okay, <laughs> the result part. Yeah, they also so, looked at uh, one more thing. Uh, they looked mm -hmm. at um, the incidence rate of non-vertebral fractures, so basically appendicular fractures. And they, um, they looked at the infection rate. Uh, and uh, we can talk about that a little bit later, but I think their assessments, uh, I think both of those are problematic. Anyway, you were about to tell us the results. Yeah, so uh, the results briefly were that, um, well, maybe before the result, the, the mean age of the participants were mm -hmm. was 74.9 uh, with a standard deviation of 4.4 years, uh, including 57%, about 57% aged 70 to 74 years. So this was most of the study participants. 38% uh, aged 75 to 84 years and a smaller percent or about 4.5 aged uh, 85 and above. Participants included 61.7% women. And the median follow-up time was three years, almost three years. Baseline participants uh, characteristics has relatively low comorbidity, comorbidity score and good cognitive and good mobility. This good was cognitive health, health and good mobility. Good, mm -hmm. A healthy population, a, a pretty yeah. healthy population. Yeah. Healthy okay. and active. They and say active. that uh, mm -hmm. they say that eighty-two point six percent were engaged in moderate to high physical activity based on the nurses' health study questionnaire. So. More this on that to population. follow. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. mm -hmm. okay. uh, also interesting that uh, the withdrawal rate was about 12%, with no difference in withdrawal rates across the DA treatment groups, which was pretty impressive. Mm -hmm. Was. And, but yet, <laughs> there was no statistically significant difference for any of the three treatments compared with their placebo or control and neither in systolic or diastolic blood pressure over three years follow-up or uh, the SPVB or MOCA and also for the uh, infections compared with placebo. So uh, this, this is the results and briefly. We actually see even a decline in the SPPB, SPPB score, uh, something in the results show that uh, <laughs> As to the strength training uh, exercise intervention, uh, they actually favored uh, the placebo. So it was, of course, not statistically significant, but it was, uh, it was as like um, following three years, and they only their muscular uh, health only decreased. If we can look at this that way, uh, and uh, I think we can. So, so mm -hmm. in brief. Um, they uh, took about 2,000 adults over 70 who are already fairly active, fairly healthy. Uh, they excluded, quite frankly, the people who needed the, this stuff the most, right? Those people were excluded. And then they followed them for three years, um, looking at their blood pressure, their non-vertebral fracture rate, their infection rate, their cognitive um, outcome, and their physical performance, and they found no difference, right? So um, looking at um, vitamin D supplementation, 
omega-3 fatty acid supplementation and strength training exercise program for these particular clinical outcomes, they say, eh, doesn't really do anything. So um, you, you've hit on the high points and the essentials of the design and the results, um, a, very, a very good abstract that you've just presented of, of what they did. What do you think? Um, so the, the, call, the so-called strength training intervention was reflecting muscle health according to the endpoints that uh, they presented as outcomes. But um, we know that uh, correctly performed strength training program has impact on all of the above health domains, not only the muscular system, not only the skeletal, skeletal muscle, muscular systems, but the metabolic have, health and cardiovascular health. Yeah. Yeah, it's correctly performed. It should um, affect all other uh, health attributes, but uh, clearly it wasn't a strength exercise intervention program as we so, and it also eludes me that uh, they assessed muscular health by SPPB, which is characterized by walking velocity, um, which some type of uh, reaction time assessment by uh, five uh, set of stands and a balance test. Um, they applied this um, in the strength training uh, exercise program for three whole years, three times a week, uh, and and then they wanted to, uh, as if they wanted to add the insult to injury when describing the best baseline characteristics, they labeled the median SPPB baseline assessment score as good mobility. So it's presented as a total mess uh, as all things regarded to strain training in this study. Uh, um, I, I, so I, I think that's right. I, I think you, you, Pretty much, uh, you pretty much nailed it there. I, I, any any other thoughts on? Uh, okay, so uh, I said that uh, I yeah, I'm not we sure about, about uh, the immunity. The, yeah, the biomarkers uh, that uh, were performed that were uh, assessed to uh, to assess the the immunity. So it's not actually it's actually not so clear to me what they did here. Yeah, I, you know, so in an abstract sense, um, setting aside uh, the strength training and the way um, they assess some of these outcomes, uh, on paper, this is actually uh, not a badly designed study. So they're, you know, they're overall, their overarching methodological and study design approach to the problem uh, was, not was not bad. Um, I think the factorial design and the statistical analysis are all okay, uh, which is why I didn't want to get into the weeds on any of that. Um, I have a few issues like the, you know, minor issues like the inclusion criteria that didn't allow people already on vitamin D or omega-3 supplements prior to the study. So if you were already on an omega-3 or you were already on vitamin D, you weren't in the study. Um, but not people who exercise. So people who are getting the, who are already getting exercise medicine, they were not excluded, but the other two medicines, they were excluded. Uh, most of this population was already exercising, as you point out. Um, I don't like using fractures as a surrogate for bone health when we should be looking at um, bone mineral density or bone quality, mm -hmm. and especially to use non-vertebral fractures uh, as an outcome, I think kind of misses the point. Um, half of the patients who were screened were excluded, and as is usually the case, um, the exclusion criteria kept out the part of the population that needed these interventions the most, mm -hmm. and I'll uh, hit that again more in a moment. Um, I think that the testing for blood pressure outcomes was infrequent perfunctory and inappropriate. And, uh, and I will have more to say about the blood pressure results, but basically, you know, how many blood pressure readings did they get during the entire study? Um, not very many. Um, assessing infections with a questionnaire is just loserness um, because we know that people including, and perhaps especially older adults have subclinical or asymptomatic infections. Um, 
they say that this questionnaire is a good instrument, but you can color me skeptical. We were both looking at that questionnaire and it does not, especially with regards to physical activity, mm -hmm. it's just, it's uh, completely not in-depth or granular enough to really assess physical activity. Um, and the same thing goes with this, you know, study of physical performance. The authors did do a power analysis and the study had good power, which is good. It looks like they used an, an intention to treat analysis, uh, which is also good, but the missing follow-up data was statistically imputed, which should definitely give us uh, some pause. But there are much bigger problems here. Uh, problem number one is the same thing that we see over and over again, very much like what we just saw in the Generation 100 study. Mm -hmm. right? They took a population that was already healthy and, and exercise active. and active, mm -hmm. and they gave them some vitamin D and omega-3s for a few years and told them to keep exercising. Although for all we know, the exercise program that they were assigned was inferior, probably was inferior to what they were already doing, right? And guess mm -hmm. what? No difference. Well, you know, no kidding. Um, the blood pressure findings are particularly revealing here. This population's blood pressure looked terrific, right, at the start of the study. At the start of the study, systolic pressures were about 143 to 144 in all groups, which is not bad for this age range. And systolic blood pressure, uh, mild systolic blood pressure elevation is not the determining factor. The real important thing was the diastolic, and the average diastolic was what, about 76 millimeters of mercury? That's just phenomenal. This was a healthy population. And, and they say that because none of the treatment arms lowered the blood pressure, there was no effect on that particular parameter. Well, why would a beneficial lifestyle intervention impact a healthy blood pressure? I mean, why would you want it to lower their blood pressure anymore, right? They already had a great blood pressure. And in fact, most of the participants did show a decrease in blood pressure. It just wasn't statistically significant. Mm -hmm. So to the extent that the blood pressure has moved in the study, they moved in the right direction. Or look at the, um, the bone health data. None of the treatment arms displayed a difference in the rate of non-vertebral fractures. In other words, if you did omega-3s or one of these silly, they are silly exercise programs, uh, or vitamin D, you didn't break your arm or your wrist or your leg as often. To my mind, that just means that none, of, that none of these interventions had an impact on how often you fall down and sustain extremity trauma, right? It doesn't tell us anything about actual bone health, uh, particularly you know, axial bone health, bone health of, mm -hmm. of the vertebra and the hip. And you know, again, if they'd wanted to tell us about that, they would have looked at BMD and bone quality. But the real, uh, real uh, kicker here, as you have already pointed out, is the exercise intervention, which is just fantastically silly. Uh, not a strength training program for any healthy population. Uh, you and I would take healthy, vigorous 70 year olds like the ones in this study, far beyond this program in the first few mm -hmm. weeks of training, right? If not on the first day. Um, so first of all, the authors make us dig up supplementary materials to see what their program looked like, right? So they go into great length about how they administered the omega-3s and, and the vitamin D and how all the pills were all the same, right? But not on how they delivered the exercise medicine. Why not, right? Would it just taken them like a couple of paragraphs because their, their exercise intervention was static and silly, right? But in the supplement, they do give us this rudimentary, awful program that might increase strength in a catastrophically frail, sedentary senior, but nobody else. And there's no, pro no protocols for progressive overload. There's minimal emphasis on structural movement. And no, there's no report on improvement. So there's no data here that the strength training medicine given in the study made anybody stronger. So, and we wouldn't expect it to, because mm -hmm. in my opinion, and I know this is harsh, the authors didn't know what they were doing with regards to the strength training intervention. Example, they say in the supplement that the seniors who wanted to increase the intensity could just repeat the program 
thus increasing their training time. And this indicates such mm -hmm. a fundamental misapprehension of what exercise intensity is that I think it just destroys our confidence in, in the entire thing. Exactly. And so, you know, you are the one who brought this paper to my attention and you will recall that I had a very negative emotional response when I first saw it because this is the problem that you and I see all over and over again. Uh, we saw it with the Generation 100 study that we, that we just did with CJ uh, a month or two ago. Uh, and so one more time, um, I want to expound on this a little bit. Mm -hmm. So let's say that you have a medicine and let's say it's an experimental medicine that supposedly improves cardiac contractility and ca cardiac output, right? It's a heart medicine and it makes your heart beat harder and increases your cardiac output. It's not well studied and the optimal dosing and safety and route of administration are still a little contentious, not completely worked out, kind of like strength training. But you want to see if this medicine given orally in low doses improves survival in patients with heart failure, okay? Your thinking is that by improving cardiac output, you will improve survival. Easy, and irrational, mm -hmm. not uh, totally rational. So you give this medicine to a thousand subjects, say 500 in a study group and 500 in a control group, and you look at their three-year survival. Um, the rates of cardiac arrest and arrhythmia and hospitalization and quality of life. And you find no difference between the groups. So you conclude that the medicine doesn't work. But you never actually looked at cardiac output in any of these patients. And that was the entire rationale underlying your hypothesis and the putative mechanism for improved survival that you hypothesized you might see. So for all you know, the dose and the route of administration of this medicine that you used in this study achieved the mechanistic endpoint, improved cardiac output. But you don't know because you never looked. If a medicine is supposed to improve survival by improving cardiac output, but it doesn't actually improve cardiac output, then why would you expect it to work? Right? At, in the way that you gave it. And that's exactly what's going on here. The authors are giving a homeopathic strength training medicine. It's not really a strength training medicine at all. It's poorly formulated, poorly administered to see if it improves some outcome or another. The underlying mechanistic rationale for strength training medicine is the improvement of strength and muscle mass and bone density. But if your strength training medicine is poorly formulated and administered, and therefore doesn't actually increase strength or muscle mass or bone density, then why in the world would you expect it to have a positive effect? You know, why in the world wouldn't you look to see if you were actually giving a medicine that did something? And how in the world are you justified in concluding that the medicine was not effective if you can't confirm that you actually gave an effective dose and formulation of the medicine. This is the problem with so much of this literature, just like the Generation 100 study. And it's the main reason why I find these results and these conclusions so unsupportable. Um, and I think it just, I think it does a real disservice because a superficial reading of this paper is going to lead people to conclude, well, why bother? Right, I can just do some. I can just do the the silly flexibility stretching program, and I'm the results I'm going to get are just as good. Um, so I th I think that you know this is a real problem, and um, this paper is a real problem, and it is indicative of a real problem that we're seeing in this literature in general. If you want to evaluate a strength training medicine for its impact on an older population you better make sure that you're delivering it property, properly and in such a way that it actually makes people stronger. Because if you're not doing that, you're not evaluating a strength training medicine. So um, that's my rant. It's, uh, and it's a shame because they had all the resources and 
Exactly. I it's mean, a beautifully this, conducted study. It is. I mean, it, look at the amount of work. Uh, uh, they obviously had resources. It was obviously well funded. A multi center trial across Europe. Pretty good study population. Um, you know, they obviously worked really hard on it. They 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 labored over uh, the controls and the power analysis and the factorial design, and they have a correct statistical analysis. There's no problem there, right? They just didn't administer the medicine that they were studying. And, uh, and I, have, I have a real problem with that. That's, you know, that's what needs to be fixed before we can really get some good answers from this kind of research. Um, you know, I wish you and I had been on the study. Um, you know, uh, people like us who actually know how to deliver this kind of medicine. Um, so uh, it, it, it's actually a real shame, I think. Anything else? I mean, I hate to end on a sour note, but <laughs> that's it. It's, you know. Um, I uh, think uh, I'll add something uh, positive uh, as a take on do. point. Mm -hmm. <laughs> The senior population uh, is, is quite a recruitable uh, study, like uh, sample. Uh, we see that uh, they quite easily recruited uh, above uh, 2,000 people all across Europe, five countries, and they had high adherence rates. Really impressive. So you have the material to work with. You just yes, need you to do. Imp implement the right uh, the right, very, uh, methods. It's a very good point. Yeah, that's what we need. We need, um, y you know, th they're asking the right question, mm -hmm. right? They're asking the right questions. They're working with the more or less the right population. I mean, I, I said a couple of things about that. You, I, you don't want to exclude the part of population that's going to derive the most improvement. I mean, we saw that in the Generation 100 study. Yeah, you mm -hmm. take a healthy population, you give them some healthy lifestyle, you know, interventions, and guess what? They're still healthy at the end of a few years, right? That I'm not sure that's the correct question, um, but you know, they they're looking at the right issues, um, but they don't really understand the exercise medicine that they're trying to deliver. Um, and to their credit, if you look at the, if you look at the limitations, it, it seems that they recognize that, but why didn't mm -hmm. they recognize that when they went into it? Why didn't their recognition of this limitation have an impact on their, on the design of their study? Um, and the problem here is, again, people are going to get the wrong message. Um, and some of those people will be physicians. Mm -hmm. uh, and some of those people will be prospective patients, um, you know, prospective athletes of aging who will, you know, will get the message from their doctors, um, from health gurus online. It's like, well, you don't have to do all this stuff. Um, and um, maybe you don't, but this paper certainly doesn't show that. So um, it's, a, it's a disappointment. It's a shame. Uh, but you're right. Uh, the materials are out there and the will to look is out there. Um, and there's, there's money and resources for investigators who want to take a look. I just think we need to change, we need to change people's idea uh, of what it means to look at this kind of medicine and, and get meaningful results. So there it is. We're on our way. <laughs> we are, we are. So, um, Vic, uh, I can't thank you enough um, for finding this paper and um, for helping me uh, break it down and analyze it. As usual, you did a terrific job. You're making a lot of work for me. Like you're, you know, you're, you're, you're finding all, so or all sorts of cool stuff. I mean, there's just not enough hours in the day to, to read all the literature that you're bringing to my attention. Um, so um, we're gonna talk about that a little bit offline. Uh, in the meantime, Thank you very much for another excellent presentation and um, Thank we'll, do you, it, Sally. we'll do it again soon. All right. Happy Thank New you. Year to you. Happy New Year and a big credit to my uh, 
trainee, uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Yosef Makori for bringing this study uh, up to my attention. So. Yes, indeed. Thank you. Yeah, give him my, give him my respects and uh, <laughs> congratulations. Um, so thank you all for joining us once again, and uh, we'll see you on our next research review. And uh, stay strong and stay healthy. <laughs>